Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Truth About Real Estate Investing show. We have an awesome episode. We're going to talk about recreational property investing. And we're talking about uh, a couple properties, uh, I think four or five properties that, and uh, to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about, we're talking about hundreds of acres, hundreds of acres, hundreds of uh, RV sites. There's even a hotel and a restaurant in there and a golf course with the uh, with Darwin Zuflu, who is the uh, owner and founder of Pinnacle Wealth Brokers. But before we get to that, before we get to that, uh, this is the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show for Canadians. It is one of the top ranked podcasts on business and investing per iTunes uh, since, and we've been around since 2016, doing an episode a week. My name is Erwin Cito. I've been a real estate investor since 2005. Um, yeah, and uh, we've been around for a long time. Podcast has been around a long time. I've been investing since two, uh, for nearly two decades. I've coached over 350 clients. And among our clients, we have about 45 self-made millionaire investor clients. Uh, this market is a wild one uh, with interest rates being really high. And it's looking like we might have another increase. There's a, there's a, there's a decent chance, maybe a one in five chance. It might be higher that we have another rate increase uh, later this fall, later this year. Uh, while uh, there's many speculators out there who are honestly feeling a lot of pain. Uh, uh, and actually, I find that a lot of people are, are in a lot of are feeling various levels of pain. Uh, but it's the speculators who are holding multiple negative cash flow properties that are uh, that are really feeling it. Uh, we checked our own numbers. Uh, our clients, uh, our clients are taking profits as well. Our clients have been selling some properties over the last six months, and we checked uh, based uh, so. Uh, so just to give you some averages, our client, the properties our clients are selling, they've held them for an average of 5.2 years. And uh, among those properties, they received an appreciation, price appreciation alone of $313,000. So that's how much uh, in minimum profits they're taking. Uh, these are all small multifamily uh, detached homes. Um, yeah, so they've, they've invested smart, they invest well, and they're, they're being rewarded with, again, uh, on a 5.2 year hold on average, Average price appreciation alone is three hundred thirteen thousand. Not bad, and uh, we know what they paid for these properties, and because um, we helped them buy them, and they bought again, they bought right. Uh, the real estate market means many things to many people. Uh, folks with houses on land in bigger markets are just fine. For example, uh, detached homes in Treb are actually uh, higher than last this time last year, and the price in July. So Toronto Real Estate Board, Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, Treb, just released their August numbers. Sorry, uh, July numbers and July prices are basically in line with June. So prices are holding, they're being resilient. Um, versus on the other side, we, the people who are really feeling it, uh, where we see a buyer's market is in the pre-construction market and cottages. Uh, those are a complete buyer's market because uh, who has a lot of money sitting aside for a recreational property, a secondary property. And uh, for folks who are in pre-construction, I hear the demands from buyers are very high. You know, it, it was always dangerous, in my opinion, to be because uh, because in the the, the pre-construction properties that I would see that came through my email, the price per square foot was higher than the resale value of uh, at, at, on that day. So, for example, I was seeing co pre-construction condos; the price per square foot would be sixteen hundred dollars a square foot, versus resale condos were going for like twelve hundred a square foot. So, in my opinion, it didn't make sense to risk that much. In general, I'm not a condo investor in general. I, I like more control of my properties. Uh, but again, to buy new versus used, it didn't really seem to make sense. Anyways, uh, all these investment options will likely be fine uh, in the long term, bit to long term. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're vacant, it's going to be painful, especially with another rate increase. And uh, we have a new housing minister. <laughs> Our new federal housing minister was respons previously responsible for immigration. So... We're, we're part, I, now I'm, I'm a family, I come from immigrants, so I believe in immigration. I believe in controlled amount of immigration. I don't know what that number is, but it seems like, you know, the fact that we've, uh, you know, I remember when, when Stephen Harper was in government, the number was more like 245,000 immigrants a year. Now we're over half a million. So something may break along the way when you double your immigration. Anyways, so my point is that long term, likely be fine. Housing market will likely be fine. Uh, but again, it's all about weathering the storm. Uh, I was speaking to one Airbnb property manager um, in the Niagara region who shared with me that uh, more supply has come on come online in the market via new construction owners, uh, as they can't cash they they know they can't cash flow. These are single family homes they're they're buying, but uh, 
but they know they can't cash those long-term tenants, so they're choosing to uh, do run an Airbnb, and they're hiring uh, these friends of mine to manage for them. So short-term rentals, uh, and I'm hearing why uh, from many sources that short-term rentals uh, for for a long time, uh, Airbnb investors are not performing as well as they used to. Uh, a friend of mine who's been operating Airbnbs for several years and was able to quit his job uh, from his Airbnb income about four or five years ago, Asha shared, me, shared with me this, that the, his Airbnbs are not performing nearly as well as they did pre-pandemic. And they are in very ideal uh, vacation areas. As for long-term rentals, um, our clients are doing just fine. Uh, I was just talking to one of my coaches, our uh, client that has a triplex, they're now rented for just over $7,000 a month. Um, you know, our clients may be vacant for a month or two while testing out record high rents. Yeah, that's the commonality between my clients that are vacant for a month or two. Uh, my last vacancy, which was just uh, two months ago, I, I, I had zero vacancy. Uh, when my tenant gave me notice, uh, we immediately found another tenant to move in the, the, ne- the, the, the first of the month. So anyways, rent prices, uh, rent market, long-term rent markets doing fantastic in, in the markets that we operate in, like Kingston and Hamilton. Uh, speaking to Coach Steve Phillips on my team earlier this week, and he shared with me that how in Kingston, his client just signed uh, a tenant for $2,600 for a three-bedroom main floor apartment in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, and uh, we have a client that just rented out. Uh, they're close to signing a lease. Uh, maybe I'll hold on to that number but they're, they're close to signing a lease for their brand new garden suite. So it's the first of, uh, probably it's probably the first garden suite uh, to be, well, at least it's the first garden suite to be rented among our clients in Hamilton. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait until that lease is signed to release that number. Uh, on the other hand, uh, small market novice and landlords appear to be struggling based on the conversations I'm having with investors who have been reaching out. They've been taking us up on our portfolio review offer. Um, Small towns that are far away from the GTA, which were darlings of, the, of real estate in the early pandemic, are not correcting. Is this now the new normal? Mm, long term, everything will hopefully be fine uh, if they can find tenants. In the short term, um, we're, we're, uh, we put out that uh, request for folks to send in their what, uh, what they have for sale, because we do have some clients that are looking and writing offers still. Of course, our clients are being very picky because they can as uh, you know, there's a lot of motivated sellers out there. So if sellers aren't that motivated, then, then our clients aren't interested. Uh, but my point is that uh, we are seeing some wonderful turnkey deals in bigger markets. Um, so markets with you know, over 150,000 population. Uh, why is that important? Uh, bigger cities and turnkey, uh, a move and ready small multifamily, to me means lower risk. I think that means to everybody, that means lower risk. Uh, one mistake I find new investors make, uh, well, maybe two mistakes, is that they believe that they, what they see on HGTV, <laughs> that money in real estate is fast and easy, which it isn't. It can be further from the truth. The other is that more work and effort means more returns. Uh, for example, I mentioned uh, earlier some of our clients are taking profits and paying out debts while rates are high. Uh, well, the best performing property among those was a, a turnkey property we, we bought from a builder. Uh, I sat with that builder to design a house that would be the perfect student rental, and it was. Uh, the house was built with uh, safety in mind. Uh, we had a lot of uh, building code requirements for duplex built uh, built into that property, even though we had no second kitchen. Uh, each of the basement bedrooms had egress windows. We uh, I had the builder do a lot of fire rated drywall and rocks all safe and sound. So there was a lot of fire separation in ceilings and mutual uh, walls. And uh, that house along with the other similar houses that our clients owned, they got the highest rents in the market and there were no renovations required. It was incredibly turnkey. It was just put up the rent the, for a rent sign and rent it out to students. That client after a seven year hold, that client walked away with $489,000 in price appreciation alone. $489,000 uh, after a seven year hold. That's nearly half a million dollars from just one income stream. That didn't include cash flow, it didn't co- include mortgage pay down. Uh, my point is that turnkey small multifamily can be a viable option. So don't discount it in thinking that uh, you have to buy an ugly property that requires months to renovate plus hundreds of thousands of dollars in renovation budget and who knows how many permits or zoning change or use change or variances. Uh, again, uh, 
from my experience, our client's experience, you can make a lot of money just buying turnkey. Uh, as a sophisticated investor, uh, one should always look at all the variety of options available to you and make decisions holistically. I've had several calls with novice investors considering uh, investment options as far as like four hours away or they have to get on a plane because the property's out of province uh, versus I tell clients all the time, it's not that hard to make money closer to home. If you can't make money in your own home, in your own backyard, then what makes you think that someone can be successful in a market where they have no contacts or no relationships? It's obviously possible. Uh, past guests of the show have, have done so, uh, but not everyone is willing to put in that kind of full-time effort, nor do they have a partner or spouse earning six figures, uh, certain, earn six figures to pay the bills and put food on the table. Remember, cash flow is important. In my experience, having worked with over 350 successful real estate investors, uh, investing within an hour drive is, is, can return world-class profits. Uh, it can be done as a side hustle. Uh, over, over 90% of my clients, they still have their day job. They do real estate investing as a side hustle and they're doing incredibly well with their real estate portfolios. Uh, they, didn't do, they didn't do so investing in pre-construction condos. They don't flip. Uh, they don't do any sort of these, these high, high effort, high risk strategies that, provide, that require private borrowing. I was speaking to another investor recently who has a very successful Airbnb, uh, but they cannot get a mortgage, so they're stuck in a uh, they're stuck paying twelve percent on a private mortgage. So yeah, there's many options. Again, you should be using a spreadsheet to make your decisions to to understand all your options. Uh, trendy fad investing can work. Uh, it just seems to take more savvy, deep pockets, uh, risk, and effort. Uh, when keeping uh, when keeping it simple, tried and proven works just fine. In my experience, at least, uh, the sad thing with with housing is that with prices so high, it's only going to be the rich who can afford deals in the current market and going forward. Uh, even more sad is this situation will only get worse when the rate cuts begin sometime next year, based on what the bond market's doing. Because because when the when you see that first rate cut, you're going to see all the the rest of the buyers get off the fence, and push this seller's market into a further seller's market. If you don't believe me, it's already a seller's market. The June Toronto Real Estate Board, uh, Toronto Real, Regional Real Estate Board, their days on market was 24 days. It took an average of three and a half weeks to sell a property. That to me screams seller's market. That's also down from 29 days from a year ago in a, in a not a very good market. <laughs> so yeah, so if you're not, if, uh, you know, check out the stats for yourself, you don't have to believe me necessarily. In Ham- and then price wise uh, in Hamilton, we're up 5.5% uh, average price year over year. Like understand that's a wonderful amount of appreciation because uh, if you bought right and you cash flow at least neutral, if you're at least neutral on cash on cash flow this time last year and say you put down 25%, right? That works out to a 22% return. That's an incredible return. And again, what do you think is going to happen when interest rates come down as they're expected to mid to late 2024? we should see prices climb. And uh, we're gonna continue sharing how our clients continue to earn world-class returns via our online monthly iWin meetings and in-person mastermind tours. So don't miss out. Keep in mind our, our in-person mastermind tours do sell out. Uh, we sold out our last one, which was in Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, we have upcoming ones in Kingston, Ontario, and we'll have one in the west, west of the GTA as well. It'll either be Hamilton or Niagara. So the best place to stay informed and be aware of when we have, when we host these events is to be on our email newsletter, along with the 10,000 other uh, eye-winningest investors in Ontario and Canada. Uh, Many of my rich friends are taking advantage of the opportunities presented by this market. So find out how you can too. Sign up for our email newsletter at www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca. Let me slow down, www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca. CA, enter your name and email address on the right side, and you're set to become a very well-informed, sophisticated investor. Uh, so speaking of simple, tried and proven, uh, Cherry, the kids and I just returned from a week-long vacation in Muskoka. No, we didn't stay at some luxurious cottage, but rather we stayed at a family camp at the YMCA on this huge property that someone, some lovely person donated to them, to the YMCA 110 years ago. There was lots of greenery, uh, an incredible amount of lakefront, and uh, most importantly, the camp counselors were wonderful as they entertained our uh, our kids via their programming. So each day, uh, our, the kids would do all sorts of activities. 
treetop trekking, wall climbing, canoeing, kayaking, swimming, sailing, nature walk hikes, uh, arts and crafts, archery, all those sorts of fun things that, that people do at camp. In the afternoons, uh, as a, then we do we could do the same activities as a family. Uh, we pretty much did them all, <laughs> except arts and crafts. I usually like a little more excitement. Uh, meals were provided, which uh, so we didn't have to cook and clean. Our accommodation was a cabin uh, with ten bunk beds, uh, so very simple accommodation. Uh, the same cabin that the overnight that the, the re- normal regular overnight campers kids use. So it's no frills. No air conditioning, no bathroom. The bed was not built for someone my size. Uh, <laughs> we had a blast. Uh, the beds could have been better for my back and my sleep, but the kids had a blast. Uh, the camp counselors were amazing. We enjoyed the meals, the campfires, and the related singing and performances, and uh, just being disconnected from technology in the city. Uh, this was our second visit to the YMCA family camp, uh, our first since the pandemic, and we plan to be there back there next year. A simple vacation. Uh, camping is tried, tried and proven to be fun for kids, and it works. Now on to this week's show. Uh, we have my friend Darvin Zuflu, who has a huge private equity brokerage. It's actually, in terms of uh, capital raise, they are the largest, and they have the largest network of uh, brokers as well. It's called Pinnacle Wealth Brokers. Uh, if you've been around the investor community, uh, you've been attending events, you've likely seen them around, um, but today we had the founder of the company joining us from Calgary, Alberta. If you're not familiar with private equities, well, you need to be, as a, um, as a good private equity is part of the reason why you hear me say things like, it's, uh, today's, the, today's time is the best time to be rich, as the options for investing have never been so good and available. Um, I was introduced to Darwin when I asked my own Pinnacle Wealth Broker representative, Steve Blasiak. I asked Steve for uh, if he knew anyone who did large scale uh, recreational properties to be a guest on my podcast. That's how we got, I got connected with Darwin. We since become friends because we share so many things in common. His recreational properties are much bigger than mine. <laughs> uh, and also because uh, I know so many of our listeners are interested in, in Airbnbs and recreational like cottage investing. Uh, Darwin has been investing in, in, he's been in the investment industry uh, since 1997 when he started at the, at the bank and he's since uh, progressed to owning a couple hundred acres. Uh, Darwin shares how he recently purchased about four or five properties that total several hundred uh, acres, uh, including among those properties, there's hundreds of uh, recreational vehicle RV sites, uh, dozens and dozens of cabins and campgrounds, and there's even a hotel and a golf course in the mix. Uh, Darwin details the story behind that purchasing of that golf course property, uh, the analysis and the value add strategy that goes into it, which I think uh, I find it particularly fascinating, so I hope you do too. Uh, In general, this is a fascinating interview into entrepreneurship in the private equity real estate investing space at a large scale. Again, uh, Pinnacle Wealth Brokers has raised over a billion dollars in capital. Um, Steve tells me it's closer to like 1.6 or 1.7. Website currently says 1.2. It's some one of those numbers, uh, and uh, and these are these they offer passive investments to middle class investors uh, to participate in passively. Uh, active or passive investors will appreciate this interview, and so if you do enjoy it, Darvin is our confirmed guest for the online uh, only November twenty first monthly Iwin meeting. Uh, at that meeting, Darvin will go into more detail. They also have. Uh, pre- slides and whatnot to show us what private investment equity investments are he'll break go into the numbers behind the story and the numbers behind these recreational property purchases hopefully including the golf course so if you're on our newsletter that's already received by over ten thousand of uh, the eye winningest investors in canada uh, then you're set if you're not on our email list newsletter go to www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca and get on our newsletter uh, we, as we are discussing securitized investments, uh, please enjoy the show and the legal disclaimer to follow <laughs> as required by the Iowan Legal Department. Uh, if you do want to learn more about investing with Darwin's company, Pinnacle Wealth Brokers, uh, Steve Blasiak, uh, who is my own broker at, at Pinnacle Wealth, his contact information is in the show notes. Uh, please enjoy the show. <laughs> Hi, Darwin. Well, what's keeping you busy these days? 
Uh, quite a lot, actually. You know, I'm busy uh, in, the, in the fund investment world, uh, focused on real estate. I uh, just got back from a, a trip to some of our uh, RV resorts. Uh, we had a charity weekend, actually, this weekend with the Starlight Children's Foundation. Uh, so a really fun weekend uh, hosting a, a bunch of families at, uh, at all of our resorts. And uh, yeah, so just got back from there, back in uh, Calgary now at our home base and just uh, just about to head back into the office for, for the next couple of weeks before we hit the road again. So hang on, you hosted families via the Starlight Charity at your at your resorts? Yeah, the Starlight Children's Foundation. Are you familiar with them? No, I, I don't no. know if they're out this way. Yeah, they so they, they, yeah they're they're quite a large organization that work uh, work with hospitals and work with uh, sick children. Um, you know, people from all different backgrounds, uh, and uh, we partnered with them uh, to look for maybe children that don't have uh, the opportunity to get out into uh, the camping kind of experience. And so we hosted uh, them and their families at our different resorts and and uh, just, you know, provided uh, food and activities and uh, a bunch of laughter. And uh, and ultimately, all of our staff at our resorts ha had a great time as well. So it was, uh, it was a win-win for everybody. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah Did you bring the fun. family? Your kids uh, all this? Uh, yeah, well, a couple of my kids are a little older and they were working. But yeah, my youngest son was there uh, working hard. Uh, uh, making the resort look good and and hosting people on the boat, and uh, yeah, yeah. So my and my wife was there uh, helping cook, and uh, and and we had a couple other staff at, at at our resort, and then like I said, we were doing it at, we were doing it at six different resorts. So yeah, it was a great time. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, okay. So for the guests, for the listeners' benefit, um, how do you say Darwin's a bit of a big deal? <laughs> All right, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Uh, so uh, for the backstory is um, how, how you got on the show was I, I asked my friend Steve, uh, our mutual friend, I said, hey, um, recreational properties are, is, a, is a hot item. Do you know like, who's, who's the best person? Who's the best person to speak to recreational properties? You know, a lot of people talk about short term rentals, Airbnbs, uh, you know, so then he introduced me to you. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I mentioned before we started recording, you're the only person I know who's who owns a golf course. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, like let's start from I don't know uh, what was how did you start your career? Like uh, let's start at your what was like your first job out of university? <laughs> yeah, my first job uh, uh, 27 years ago working for uh, one of the big banks, and uh, my second job was working for one of the other big banks, and then uh, and then my third job going into working for one of the large insurance companies. So. Yeah, I started uh, my entire adult life working uh, with investments and uh, ultimately in the financial industry. And, and my early years were were kind of a training ground. It took all the courses that I could take and and uh, tried to move my way up uh, within the ranks. And mm -hmm. you know, eventually went uh, more independent and, and got into the business owner side of things, which was kind of what my aspirations kind of always were. Since uh, since you know going to business school, that was uh, that was my goal. So. Um, yeah, learned a lot about the banks and how they operate and, you know, how, how they make money and how they tell their advisors, you know, these are the different investments that, you know, make us, uh, make us the money. And this is your report card on how well, uh, on how well you're doing for making the bank money. And, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, I, I wanted to find other investments and other ways for people to make money, uh, than just what, what the bank was providing. So, uh, ended up moving more into the independent channel where I had a little more say, a little more choice into, into, into searching for these investments. Our, our slogan at Pinnacle Wealth has been, you know, continually seeking unique opportunities to find or to create wealth for investors. And uh, by by doing it on our own and having our own team of people that look for these great opportunities, um, you know, we have the freedom to choose what, what we believe is best, not necessarily what a big corporation feels that we should mm -hmm. be, you know, pushing on investors. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was that was the the beginning of my career though, with the, the banking world and and looking at all the different products that the bank had, uh, and then uh, you know, taking courses through the Securities Institute and. And, uh, you know, I'm a fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute. And the more I learned about investing in the public markets, the more I realized uh, this is not something that you can predict. And it doesn't really matter how good I get. I have no, there's no ceiling uh, here where I can say now I know what I'm doing and I can really make a ton of money for myself and investors. Because really, the more I knew, the more I realized I'll never know. Like, 
right? Like Warren Buffett, you know, he's, he's buy great companies and hold them. Don't try and trade stuff. I uh, don't think that you can beat the market because, because ultimately you can't. And so mm-hmm. that was less challenging uh, for me than when I realized I can't become a guru in, in a space. So um, that's where I started to lean more towards uh, the real estate side of things, because I do think you can control, uh, you can control your own market a little bit better. You can predict where the market's going without it turning on a dime. Uh, whereas in the public markets, um, you know, it, it turns earlier and earlier, you know, before we hear about something happening in the public markets, the big money's already moved out of it, right? Like it's, it's happening so fast now and it's so sophisticated, uh, that there's, there's really no, no fun in it, right? There's no, cause you, you can't, you can't beat it. And so, yeah, coming into the private world and investing in private companies became my focus. Right. And the, and private companies don't have that turning on a dime. You know, the the news comes out and all of a sudden the share price has a has a massive change. Uh, normally, the the valuations are dependent on well, what's the income being generated from the company? What's the outlook for growth in the company? And what's the sector look like? And and so back to more normal investment fundamentals in the private side and more specifically in the real estate side, like I said, there's a little bit more uh, predictability and, and I really like hard assets. And so, um, you know, going into into the private side, we focused uh, pretty heavily on on hard assets uh, just just, you know, for reasons that you know of. And I'm sure uh, most of the listeners really like about real estate. That's, a, that's my full Darwin. Thank you. Uh, um so a good friend of mine was uh he worked for one of the big banks as a financial advisor uh, his clientele was like i think three million and up in assets under management so like he was he was decent and he one of his including he had a major real estate influencer client as well i'm not gonna name names because it's private obviously uh and then so i go i go i go like oh that's awesome what kind of cool stuff can you offer him like private stuff like stuff that i can't get and he's like nothing <laughs> no <laughs> no private equity options Everything yeah. that, everything that, 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 you know, like 10 million assets under management guy, I can get all access to the same stuff. And it's all, you know, all stuff people are not aware, aware of GICs, mutual funds, ETFs. Like, so, so, so what do you guys do different then? So yeah. what, what was your experience? Like that were, was there many hard asset options or real estate options for while working uh, at like, while working for financial, for, for public financial institutions? nothing at all back then um, Zippo? yeah i see my bank post. offers i can buy gold from my bank but it's really expensive yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the fees they charge are ridiculous like, like yeah. is that it <laughs> yeah yeah there's no options it was it was actually quite disappointing in in what you could provide your clients so uh having to look for something something different um you know they're they missed out i think they missed out in a big way over the last 20 years uh, I think they realize that. And today, I think they're still trying to figure out how do they do it? How do they get into the space? And, mm-hmm. and uh, so there's there's going to be a slow change over the number of years. But right now, the options are still very limited. So, uh, so at Pinnacle Wealth, did you did you buy it? Did you start it? Yeah, I, I founded it at Pinnacle Wealth. So like like you were saying, uh, uh, the way it came to be founded was was almost by by accident. But when you talk about how you ask a broker, like, can you invest in real estate? Can you invest in privates? Uh, there was no option. So I started doing that for my clients. When I left the bank and the insurance company, <clears throat> I was looking for these private options as an independent you know, and I was a business owner, didn't intend to have brokers at the time. I just wanted to be able to offer publics and privates to my client base. And what I found was that a lot of my new clients were actually financial planners that worked at the banks or they worked at a large mutual fund broker. And I'm like, why are you guys, why are you guys buying your RSPs for me? Like it just like, and you know, it just really clicked when I was driving uh, on the road from a road trip, signing up a bunch of clients on flow through shares. Um, you know, cause flow through has a very short window of season when you can get in to get your tax deductions. Uh, but, but again, most of these clients, again, were financial planners. They understood these investments. They couldn't sell them to themselves. And, uh, ultimately, uh, some of them were asking, Hey, can I come work with you? Can I do what you do? And so ultimately, uh, we had a, a broker network being formed. And uh, back in 2009, we were the rated by uh, Fast 50 Growth, number one Fast 50 Growth uh, company in Alberta, um, and you know continued on that path. 
um, and, and did some rebranding and ultimately went to national uh, with, with Pinnacle Wealth Brokers uh, in, in 2010. And, um, and it was a unique time in the marketplace uh, yeah, with, with regulations and a lot of, a lot of regulation changes kind of came into place because uh, our, our regulators uh, province by province were seeing the, the, the demand and the change for, for uh, private investments and what they call. So, you Sorry, know, Jarvin, you're having to be regulated un under every province? Are you, yeah, how many provinces are so you regulated under? That sounds like a pain in the butt versus, like, versus a single <laughs> regulator. Because yeah, like, I believe in the states, it's just one regulator. There's one one that's, national. That's right, one one national regulator. So um, yeah, it's something that's a little disjointed in in Canada. Having our provinces, I have ten different provinces that Pinnacle Wealth Brokers is regulated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not, isn't that like a lot more expensive than necessary? <laughs> I know, obviously, you have to do it. Like they write the rules, so but. Mm -hmm. Damn. Our compliance department is is our biggest department because uh, <laughs> you go from one insurance regulator, kind of they do their routine reviews, and then the next province comes. They all have their responsibilities to oversee the activities happening in their province. Right. And so your compliance happens. budget must be millions. <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive. It is expensive. <laughs> the cost of doing okay. business for sure. Right. So not okay. It's not a business you start overnight. <laughs> so. No, it takes time to build for sure. And it's not, it's not the easiest business to be in for sure. So how I got introduced to Pinnacle, I don't think Brian Polis was mine that I share was, uh, this was years ago. So uh, a friend of mine, Brian Polis uh, of Polis Investments, um, uh, he, he, he was one that introduced me to Pinnacle because he was telling me how uh, he wanted to be on the, on the best. He wanted to work with the best. Yeah. And, and that's how he ended up with you guys. I know, it was, and you know, I heard it was a long process. You guys, you guys are uh, just from what I hear. You guys are not. You guys are quite picky. <laughs> the diligence period is long, like a couple of years. Uh, but yeah, but that's that's how I got first introduced to Pinnacle, and that was like that was a long time ago. Yeah, Brian and, and Poulos have been one of the the REITs that we've been raising money for 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 many years now. <laughs> And uh, you know they've they've done very well and, and been a successful uh, investment for us as as most of our reads have been, um, but we do get approached uh, quite often, and so we do have to have a very detailed selection process that our corporate finance team goes through from you know the finance side, the legal side, the client right. side, and the you know the sellability. What's unique about them and what what makes them sell in a portfolio? So. Because what yeah. I've heard is, uh, you know, if you want to be bigger, you, uh, like raising capital is either a full-time job for yourself and that's several others, or you can work with someone like Pinnacle Wealth. Uh, so can you can you uh, explain for the listener what it, what Pinnacle Wealth Brokers does? Yeah, we uh, we bring um, private investment opportunities to market to the retail channel across Canada, and uh, we look at uh, we try to look at a wide variety of investments uh, so that people are, are properly diversified. We have uh, dealing reps in all the provinces in Canada, all the main provinces. And so we're coast to coast and those right. dealing reps are, you know, financial advisors really advising on private investments. Um, in Quebec, they're also able to become mutual fund uh, uh, licensed if, if they wish. And um, some of them are a life insurance license. And so really they're, and they refer to portfolio managers on the public side if, they, if they're not offering that themselves. And so we're a portfolio manager as well. So there's different registration categories, but we offer public investments. Uh, but our niche is really just bringing these private opportunities to market, helping get the offering memorandums created uh, so that we can go raise capital. Uh, in, in a compliant manner, and and then ultimately we we stay up to date on the investments that, that we're raising capital for, and uh, and work with them, uh, you know, if if uh, on the financial side, and, and monitor the investments uh, as uh, as they grow, and and ultimately you know we see the benefit of them growing and becoming successful uh, uh, investments like Century, and we brought to market um, through a company that we had acquired. Uh, when they were new, and uh, they're they're one of the largest REITs, uh, private REITs in Canada uh, today. What, and what are, what are they? Like six billion? What are they? I think they're yeah. They have a few different funds now, and it adds up to about six billion dollars. Right. So so uh, 
Yeah, because the the uh, is it the president or the owner? He has a wonderful newsletter. So for listeners, like if you're interested in geeking out on uh, what someone consumes and thinks about real estate, who man yeah. who who manages six billion, <laughs> check out check out his newsletter. <laughs> and and um, ha, um, what's my next question? So uh, Pinnacle's quite large, are you not? Like you're national. I can't imagine many are many EMDs are national. Yeah, we, I think we uh, we have more dealing reps, uh, so more presence uh, than anyone in Canada. We we have about seventy, I think seventy eight dealing reps uh, uh, from coast to coast right now. Um, raised about one point three billion in retail dollars into the exempt market products that we offer, and uh, yeah, and like I said, we're growing growing on that side, and and uh, and also trying to reach out to the financial advisor network, like I said, the work at the public companies and then just show them like that's part of our goal in the next five years to really show them what they can have access to because they can come and offer uh, what we have to offer and what they can still offer what they have to offer. So they can properly diversify their clients. Yes. Proper yeah. diversification, I think is the key word there. Uh, and and so uh, for the for the newer listeners or you know, the smaller investors, when when so from what I see is when when um, when say like an apartment building investor wants to scale up, uh, generally capital is their is their biggest issue. It's assuming well, most of them are quite talented at finding good deals, uh, mm-hmm. but you know you kind of need to focus on one thing. Uh, most of them seem to fo- most will will uh, go to someone like you to try to, to raise the capital for them. So, mm-hmm. so I imagine you get a lot of people asking you to do their fund, their uh, capital raising for them. What do you think it is like ten to one? Like ask to actually get on your shelf as an offering, hundred to one? Yeah, um, I know we, we we used to track that a little bit better. Um, it's about one a day that approaches us. And, uh, <laughs> you know, lots of those don't even have an offering yet. They just have an idea. Some of them have a full offering memorandum already done, but we want to make changes. But yeah, we only add um, six to eight new kind of offerings uh, or maybe less than that, maybe less than six offerings a year now. Uh, so the, yeah, the ratio is is certainly uh, very, very challenging for an issuer to try and get onto the shelf. You got to have a track record. You got to really have a strong team behind you. Uh, you got to have really good corporate governance and you got to be in the right sector. You got to be offering something unique. Can't just be raising capital so that you can you know, buy something to grow for yourself. Uh, it has to be like, how do you really provide extra opportunity for investors you know, to provide an above average mm-hmm. return? That's what we're mm-hmm. looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, and we look at risk adjusted return, like just ultimately that's what it's about. Like if the risk can be higher, return for investors has to be higher too. Sadly, I find uh, the understanding of risk adjusted uh, returns is uh, lost on many people. Like for example, I've seen like promissory notes for like 17%. So unsecured loans for 17%. And I'm like, you know, uh, the credit, your credit card will want like 20 to 30% for that same kind of security and risk that you're taking on. Why would you yeah. give it away for 17%? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, let's move on. Um, uh, uh, so how many products can you give it? Can you give us like a high level number? Uh, like give us a, a listener, a, a high level understanding of like what kind of products you guys offer uh, um, opportunities you offer? Cause yeah. I've talked to Steve and it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly varied. <laughs> you're telling me about like you have some like you have some like music one as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We when we look for something uh, like unique opportunities to increase wealth, right? That's our mandate, and so a lot of stuff you'll see will be a little bit different than what you you find. So Steve mentioned uh, uh, music royalty fund. So um, through ICM, they 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 have the investment business and they have a REIT, but they also came out with the music royalty fund and brought some talented people together. Uh, to buy, uh, you buy uh, uh, songs that have a long-standing track record of being played, and you get a royalty uh, when those songs are played. It goes into back to the owner of the of the song. Um, and what we like about it is it's very diverse. It's not correlated with uh, your stocks or your bonds or your real estate. 
And so, um, yeah, just a very unique opportunity that, uh, that provides a, a consistent return as mm-hmm. risk. The song could stop being played, mm-hmm. right? Like you look at the the Friends soundtrack or whatever that was on the, the TV show Friends or whatever, that one went up for sale. And um, as long as it keeps getting played, uh, there's there's royalties coming back. And so that's why you have ownership in the friend song. We we didn't know our fund uh, didn't buy that one, but that's oh, okay. an example of like the different kinds of songs that you can buy. I thought that one went for like three hundred thousand dollars, and then you kind of own the royalty. So it's not not super expensive. The goal for the for this music royalty fund is is to buy ones that they believe will continue to be played, right? Or or have a, an increased amount of what they're being played. So right, so, right. So yeah. yeah. So if I'm trying to time it, I would sell it before the season's the series is over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot that goes into into their right. business for sure. Uh, and the key again, good, great management team, uh, you know, with the, that understand what they're doing and understand the business and very prudent on the financial side. Right. Uh, it's, it's easy to get excited about something, but you got to make sure it makes long term financial uh, right. success. And, uh, and you mentioned uh, you do you you have Centurion, which is incredibly boring apartment buildings, six billion. Yeah just apartment buildings yeah but uh, some of the very best managers in the space right so uh they they've provided us double digit returns you know for for a long time now so right. the last 13 years yeah. uh oh, so we my have, mom's uh, invested in the the car wash fund, <laughs> car wash fund. yes yeah. yeah so you know we, we thought well what's a unique aspect uh where, where you can get into real estate but maybe they can generate a little bit better return than, than the typical real estate and so car wash you have the business side you got the real estate side so we like that asset class i think that was probably closer to 2015 when we got into that mm-hmm. um and then after that it was uh, storage facilities like mm-hmm. Can you consolidate or build uh, storage facilities where, mm-hmm. where there's high demand? So that was nationwide that started doing it in, you know, closer to Van- in Vancouver. You know, instead of going buying cheap land where the storage is spread out, they thought they'll, they'll, they'll go more vertical and and be more walkable uh, and and closer in proximity because there was high demand for that mm-hmm. uh, in Vancouver. So that that's just you know one other real estate kind of asset class. Mm-hmm. We have stuff that's not real estate at all. We we built a fund we call it Pinnacle Institutional Access Fund, and it's 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 access to BlackRock as a money manager. And uh, and so they they invest into private companies that are much larger scale than than other companies you would see on the pinnacle wealth brokers shelf uh so they're investing uh, in, in the united states in europe and asia and and so they yeah, anyway that that is one of the funds that is is very unique to us uh we we chose not to use their real estate funds because we have lots of real estate but they're they're buying secondaries funds uh funds in private companies that uh, may be large investors need liquidity so they might need to sell the the private fund that they got into you know five years ago and so now they sell a pool of uh of private investments and and our institutional blackrock uh fund the, those managers of blackrock you know money largest money managers in the world uh decide which ones that they want to get into and and get out of so that performs very well uh and, and makes up uh, uh you know a good chunk of my register plan uh portfolio um, and then, uh, yeah, well, we have lot, lots of different kind of unique opportunities that, that mm-hmm. we're always looking out, but it gives you a, kind of a, a general scope of like, you know, what we do at Pinnacle Wealth Brokers. Uh, that's why, I, when I explain to someone, uh, new to this space, I, I say, uh, you know, this is the way I explain it is, uh, the analogy I use is, uh, it's like a mortgage broker who has access to many different types of mortgages and lending products. Uh, you guys are a broker of different investment opportunities in the private equity space. Fair. That's right. Yeah, we exactly. That's a really good way to explain kind of what right. we do. Yeah. Right. And your job is to quarterback, which we think is best for the client and including diversify. You can, one can diversify across many funds. You don't just, you don't, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You can, that, that's key. Whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You said it before, right. Diversification is key and uh, it's easy for anybody all of us as investors might favor a sector right we might favor apartment buildings 
and, and maybe you win on apartment buildings or you have one on them, but uh, you don't know what the future holds. And that's why uh, financial planners always tell you to diversify. And, and that's the dro- job of our brokers is to make sure what's in investment, what's in your investment portfolio is suitable for you, mm-hmm. matches your time frame, matches your risk tolerance, mm-hmm. and that you're diversified, you're not over concentrated just into one sector. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we can edit this out later, but I believe my mom's returns on Polis was 14% last year. So she's quite happy with that. <laughs> Past does not predict the future. This is not financial advice. Don't sue anyone. <laughs> Uh, now I want to ask about your own personal investing, um, because we started off the show, we're talking about like recreational property and, and, uh, yeah, please. Like, um, like you were talking about like Warren Buffett, for example, like Warren Buffett course corrects along the way, like, Mm -hmm. like 10 years ago, did you ever think you'd be buying recreational property? (laughs) Yeah. Um, for me, like I've, I have been in the, like, I've always had a, you know, uh, I bought a cottage at a young age, uh, grew up at water, as a competition water skier. And so our family was always on the lake. And uh, so I like that space. We have a recreational property for 15 years in Honduras. And and so I think a lot about it. And I think about the pros and the cons. And uh, ultimately, uh, when I had some money coming back from some of our exempt market products, I needed to deploy, redeploy, and I, I wanted to think of something that I could hold for the long term. Like, what do I really believe in? What sector can I just, mm-hmm. you know, have a 10 plus year time horizon that I can invest in? And uh, uh, ultimately, we we thought the campground space hasn't really been touched by big investors. So, um, you know, what you've seen happen with apartment buildings or even office space hasn't really happened in this space yet. And and we happen to be living in um, you know Alberta, and we spend our time in British Columbia. Those are the two best places in North America to invest in this space. Uh, so yeah, I made an investment with my own money to try it uh, on the first uh, you know fund I call it, um, and and it worked out really well. And so we thought, well, let's see if we can replicate this uh, and, and do some other properties and start inviting investors in. So I, although I invested in, in in all the properties that we have. Um, there's only two that was kind of myself and my business partner, um, that is just us. And, and now we're doing a fund that is, is for everybody. Um, so before we're recording, I mentioned it. I think it's, uh, I think it's the right thing to do is to cut your teeth with your own money before, you, you know, well, you and your business partner, but yeah, but he was, he was active on this too. You guys needed each other. Um, yeah. Uh, I think it's I think it's the appropriate thing to cut your own teeth with your own with, with your own money before going to use other people's money to invest, especially especially when it's something that you that hasn't been done before. Um, mm-hmm. That's not where I was going with the, my next question. My next question is actually: Can you speak from your own experience the importance of using recreational property? Because like you know, you went from you know university to owning a nation, nationwide broker network. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't easy. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't a four-hour work week, was it? <laughs> no, no. I read the book, loved it. It had a great concept. But uh, uh, yeah, getting down to 40-hour work week still like still a goal. <laughs> um, so yeah, how did I get to recreational space is your question? Uh, well, well uh, like what's your experience? Like how important is recreational space to you, to yourself? Because again, like your journey has not been easy, right? I'm sure there was yeah. you know, your business building. You, you know, you had a startup, right? I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure that's stressful. You have like you have four kids. Four kids, yeah. Four kids, yeah. Busy, busy. Yeah. So I guess you know, from my family aspect, getting into the recreational space seemed like a good way to start finding balance. Uh, you know, that's one of the slogans we use at Pinnacle Lifestyles. You know, finding balance. Um, getting out of the desk for me was a big thing. I spent a long days in front of a computer and eventually that catches up with your knees, your back, your neck, you know, even your, your forearms if you're typing. And so, uh, yeah, health and fitness. Um, I, I grew up being more athletic than I found myself as an adult because I wasn't getting out enough, uh, playing, playing enough sports. And so, yeah, but this, I realized that's when you're happy too, is like after a workout, you usually feel better, right? Uh, after going to play hockey with your friends or going to do any kind of sport, 
uh, you feel good. Getting out in nature. One of the things that really astounded me was uh, an article that came out uh, uh, when we were starting the uh, Pinnacle Lifestyles was, you know, doctors now prescribing prescriptions to go for a walk in the park. And it's like, what? That sounds so crazy. And uh, But the more you read into uh, into nature, the more healing uh, you realize that it does for you. And so uh, in some cases, it, it can replace antidepressants, uh, but ultimately it does, uh, it does uh, make you feel good. It re- releases endorphins to be out in nature and just hear the creek the water running through the creek and the birds chirping and 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 just to get outside uh, hiking and walking in the park uh, is really good so for me it was a feel good thing it was health for me looking for what's healthier for me in the future and uh and, and how do you help others um we know that there's a big problem with uh uh technology really consuming our our time and our minds especially kids and that was a concern for me and my kids was was seeing how these, you know, these, all these new apps um, really have their attention and, um, and their mood, right? Their mood after spending time, you know, not to pick on anyone, but TikTok or Instagram or something for a couple hours, their mood's not the same, right? Uh, as you go out and you play baseball with your kids and then you see what their mood is after, and it's just a night and day difference. And so I have a, a pretty big passion now of trying to uh, encourage people just to get out and to, and to be more active and, and live mm-hmm. that healthier lifestyle. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's a bit of a feel good investment for sure. Uh, this is, this is a, a, I love where this conversation is going because I, I find many real estate investors um, like, you know, I never th- grew up thinking I wanted to be a landlord. And so yeah. what I find a lot of investors are uh, new and, and veteran is they're always trying to figure out, they're trying to figure out where can they find their passion within real estate. And, and then, and you're a living example, like you're doing exactly that, right? You found your passion. So, so tell us more about, uh, about, I don't know, maybe the first two projects you, you put, you got, you, you, you started doing with recreational wise. Yeah. Well, I mean, we always look at investment fundamentals. I mean, we're, we're an investment brokerage. We looked at thousands of opportunities. And so, um the the one stat that came out that uh really uh that tom brought to me who's my my business partner uh was there's uh 20 recreational vehicles or rvs for every uh place to plug an rv into in in british columbia and 18 rvs for every place uh, to plug an rv into in, in alberta then you go into ontario and it's more like six to one uh, and, you know, and, and a lot of the United States is a lot lower. So it's just a, it's out of balance. There's not enough RVs, especially serviced RVs. There's some dry land camp, more dry land camping probably than a lot of places uh, where people can go that, that don't need any services. And so there is camping opportunities, but we know where the trend's going. People want electricity, right? People want running water and services. Um, so we look at that as a very solid investment fundamental to base our, our location of business on, right? Because with real estate, it's location, location, location. So when we get asked why we're not in all these other places, I just go back to you know the, the number one fundamental that made me want to start this business. And, um, and then we looked at it from, from different angles. Like how do we do better than what an average campground owner gets? Are they getting an eight cap or a 10 cap on their investment where, you know, apartments are maybe going down in cap rates. So, um, you know, there is, there is opportunity to take a campground and increase the revenues. I think we're well over 40% uh, in the first year of, of our operational campgrounds that already have the service RV sites in there and being able to increase uh, the revenues from it. Um, so there's, there's lots of little things you can do as a company to be strategic, to you get more customers coming and take advantage of off season, uh, take a business that's actually profitable in two months of the year. Cause we're in Canada, right? Like, like these campgrounds make their money in July and August. Uh, you might have May long weekend or September long weekend, but you, you don't make money uh, typically in those months. And so, uh, from an investment side, we go in and say, is this something we can make money in, in more than two months, uh, going forward. And so we're, we're looking for those ones like fishing resorts. Well, April, May are really good fishing months and September and October are really good fishing months, but they're also on beautiful lakes. So, you know, uh, you know, white Lake fishing, uh, we have a fishing resort at white Lake and the shoe swaps in British Columbia, where it's top 10 rainbow trout fishing lake. Uh, and so it gets a much longer season and, uh, it's just a great investment with consistent cash flow and, 
people are spending more on fishing. So we upgraded our, our old, old owner's residence and we're making a fishing lodge. And we'd like to keep evolving that into, into providing a more uh, services to people that maybe want to have fishing guides in the future. So we're not there yet, but we are oh. go fishing boats. You know, I mean, oh, that sounds awesome. I need a fishing guide. I don't know anything. Yeah. I'm not even like putting a worm on my hook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> guide, uh, hook, need worm. <laughs> you know, and, it, and fishing is a really cool thing. Again, it's it's not a sport that's getting yeah. your, you know, your, your endorphins out as much as, as most yeah. sports. But uh, when someone gets up like this weekend with the, 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 the Starlight Children's Foundation, we had a few kids to catch a fish for the first time in their life. You know, some of these kids were 16, 17 years old, and, you know, smile on their face is just priceless. Yeah. It's a fun sport for for people of all ages, and yeah, yeah some some that I've, I've grown to like more and more. I did a lot when I was young, and I hadn't done it much the last uh, thirty years. You know, I can recall every memory of uh, fishing with my kids. I'm sure you created some amazing memories with uh, uh, across your six resorts for those uh, poor children. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did. They 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 all had a good time. Uh, we got some some positive reviews from from I think all the families, and, uh, and but even just our regular campers, right? Like just it's just one smile at a time, right? And that's our that's our goal for for our staff at all the different resorts. Help create smiles. Uh, so for the listeners' benefit, like and my benefit too, how do you describe like six? You have six resorts. Like how many campgrounds is that? How many? RVs do you can you host like how do, how do you quantify that for somebody just so they can understand the scale <laughs> yeah um well they're all very greatly in size and so we have uh, where I have my cabin and I bought it more just because it's where I wanted to be it's it's very small 1.4 acre campground 20 RV sites five other cabins uh to rent out and then, <laughs> okay, that alone is pretty big for somebody. <laughs> Five cabins, one point four acre, twenty RV sites. Okay, that's that's a, that's more than a mouthful for most. Okay, so that's one. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have one in Edson, which is the first one that, that I bought with Tom, and, and it was uh, one hundred and forty three uh, fully serviced RV sites. Uh, we got a private lake. We got a couple suites, like condo style suites, and and uh, and a cabin on that one. And we have like 100 acres of expansion room. So we'll keep building RV sites on properties like that. Uh, we have we have the the golf resort Kokanee Springs in in the Kootenays, and uh, that one is uh, 432 acres. Uh, so it didn't have any RV sites. We bought it and and we put on RV sites. So we just we're just launching, uh, like I said, at the beginning of June, um, like. 36 RV sites uh, for, for rent and then 26 RV sites for sale. And we have nine new cabin lots that uh, we've constructed on that property. And then, uh, then we, oh, sorry, are the cabins for going to be for like Airbnb or, or, or your hotel or it'll be, well, there it'll be ownership. So if somebody wants to have their own cabin for ownership and then pinnacle lifestyle is actually uh, has a management company and it's through our same investment fund uh, that that we manage we'll rent those out so if you want to rent yours out we'll do all the work for them we'll advertise it we provide the cleaning and come in and, and get them rent ready for everybody in between customers okay amazing okay all right. yeah, and then go, going on to um, uh, other resorts we have Revelstoke and Sycamus uh, I guess we have about 180 sites in our Revelstoke campground, and uh, I think it's 86 sites in the Sycamuse campground. Um, uh, we have gold that I didn't, that's not one of our six campgrounds because it's just, it's 200 acres of riverfront property that's not developed yet. So it's nice, beautiful treed property. Uh, actually on the Columbia River, on both sides of the Columbia River. And it actually owns on both sides of the Waitabit Creek. So there's kind of a, where two rivers can join. We, we own all around this, this beautiful junction of, of two gorgeous rivers. So again, fly fishing and, and the trails, the ATV trails and stuff from there are, uh, are quite wonderful. Um, one of the top, it's, it's right across the, the road from um, a staging area for sledders and snowmobilers. So again, it's one of those places that we can make a 12 month of the year season uh, close to the ski hill in Golden. And, uh, but a uh, beautiful summer and winter and fall and spring destination really. So mm -hmm. 
So that one we'll put on a few hundred RV sites like we will with the Kokanee Springs Golf Resort. We'll put a, a few hundred, like three to 400 on each of those properties. So yeah, that, that kind of gives you an idea of, of the size of the properties. But the investment horizon of like continually being able to develop more lots in a resort that is already popular and attractive mm -hmm. uh, and then allowing people to either rent or allowing them to buy. Uh, we have both options. And I think we're the, probably the, the only unique company that does this in, in North America where you can come in and you can kind of do both. You can have multiple properties uh, so you can move around from, from different uh, locations if you wish. Uh, but we're allowing people to invest, uh, not invest in a fund that owns all of these uh, different resorts. And we do have three different funds that own those ones that I mentioned. Uh, fund three is the one we're on now and everything going forward will be in this, this uh, Pinnacle Lifestyles Fund three, uh, but they own the management company. So they own the rental revenues. They own the golf course. They own the, we have a 62 room hotel uh, that's at that golf resort. So they would own that. Um, and so they get the, they get the fees from the restaurant revenues. Uh, we have a, a marina at the, the White Lake Fishing Resort. So they would own part of the marina and the boat rentals and the gas, the, the only, it's the only gas station on the lake. And so, you know, there's, there's multiple streams of income in, in what we have is one different investment. Mm -hmm. One investment that's very unique at Pinnacle Wealth Brokers to, to invest into this sector. And it's a sector that I don't think many people have in their, in their investment portfolio. And it happens to be RSP eligible. So, you know, if you want to buy it with uh, a TFSAs or, or your registered plans, you can do that as well. Uh, so. Darwin, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, yeah. How much how much did it cost to acquire all these properties, and over what period of time? Like I know one of them is one of those a personal property or cabin, mm -hmm. but like all the other ones that were bought strictly investment purposes. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Don't quote me on the exact numbers, but we're in for about seventeen million on on the equity on these properties. Is that, yeah. Over what period of time? Uh, over the last uh, three years. Yeah. Okay, so an average of six million to deploying in every every year. <laughs> yeah. And that's the reason we went to a full investment offering for accredited investors uh, to, to allow accredited investors to get in. But in order to uh, to get to the velocity of building mm -hmm. uh, all the amenities and, and the mm -hmm. campsites and the cabin sites that we want, uh, it does require a fair, fairly high amount of equity. Um, and, and then, so we, we also use, uh, uh, some debt, but we're, we're very low leverage in this time of higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. So we prefer equity for sure in this space. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to speak to the listener. Like, uh, you, you've said, uh, you've dropped many golden nuggets. Like, for example, uh, you mentioned you're trying to extend beyond just the summer season because, um, like uh, generally for Airbnb, it is Canada generally, generally Airbnb, for example, uh, most all of our friends and even my own experience was the summer killed. Christmas killed uh, as mm -hmm. long as, um, but then maybe Thanksgiving, but you know, that, there's a lot more to the year than that. So you mentioned snowmobiles, if it's uh, the property snowmobile um, near snowmobile trails, that'll be popular. You mentioned mm -hmm. fishing. That's a new one for me is, uh, is hearing about like the, uh, the, the fishing um, opportunities within for that property, make it more marketable as well. It gets you more rentals. Uh, Cause like, I literally have friends who rent the entire winters in like Muskoka, for example, to snowmobilers when normally yeah. you get nothing else. Like if you're not, if you're a three season cottage, then you don't get that business. But if you do, then that's available. Right. Yeah, every property we have actually is uh, close to fishing and every property we have is close to snowmobiling. And, uh, and I think all of them are, are not that far. Edson would be the farthest from a ski hill, right? From a world-class like ski destination, you know, Revelstoke, we're in the city of Revelstoke. And it's the tallest vertical of any mountain in North America, right? Golden has one of the one of the most popular ski hills, and we got three that are about an hour drive from the Kokanee Springs destinations. They're all. Damn, they're all you didn't mention ski till now. <laughs> Here in Ontario, <laughs> you're in Blue Mountain. You're killing. <laughs> yeah, I know four of our properties are, are kind of in the the Rocky Mountain area, so we're you know Golden being the heart of the. The national parks you can go in all directions and find a, a national park within the rocky mountains from golden and and so from that standpoint you see people coming from you know eastern canada but you see people coming from asia you see people coming from europe uh because they want to go to the rocky mountains and they want right. a lot of them do want to own 
a, a piece of that, right? They, and so I think in the future, we're going to see a lot more people wanting to own, you know, in the national or close to the national parks. You can't own in a national park like, you know, Banff uh, is, is the closest uh, uh, beautiful mountain destination for us in Calgary, but you got to drive past Banff and then you can go to Lake Louise and then Golden is next. So it's one of the closer destinations where you can actually have ownership to these kind of properties. Are oh, you seeing much action from Americans? In Kokanee, we're starting to see them come back again for the Gulf Resort. Uh, they, you know, through, through COVID, that had slowed down a little bit, uh, but also increased in uh, people that were more local. Uh, they didn't have to travel as far. So we're seeing that. We're seeing in Revelstoke, for sure. Uh, we, we just have tourists because a lot of our properties around there on Highway 1, you know, Revelstoke and, and, and Sycamus and, and White Lakes off Highway 1. So you, you get a lot of people coming from the United States and also from Europe. Uh, a lot of people will come from Europe and rent a camper van and they'll stop at all these properties along the way between Vancouver and Calgary. It's a very mm -hmm. popular route. If I don't have a snowmobile, can I rent one from you? <laughs> yeah, we don't rent them, but um, no. Coming we, soon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we work close with a company called Stomping Ground. And so they do they do a TV show, actually. And they've done, they've filmed the TV show at all of our different resorts. Uh, and they're big snowmobilers and ATV years. And so they have all the fun toys and equipment. And, and so I, th I think in, as part of their future will be opportunities to, uh, to get into snowmobiles and they, they do snowmobile awesome. tours and yeah. That's so awesome. They, yeah. they have a pretty right. fun, fun show. Yeah. Oh, uh, can, can, uh, can you share the story of the, uh, how, because for, for someone, because I'm sure for the listener, this sounds all massive. Uh, it is because it is big. <laughs> Can you share the story of how you bought the, the, the golf course in Kokanee? Like, what was the story behind that? How much can yeah. you share? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. That's a unique. Um, it's a golf resort that's been there for, for well over 50 years. Very mature uh, trees um, and, and just a gorgeous property. Uh, it had different owners over the past. And like most golf courses, uh, when you build a golf course, very expensive, and then you got to build a customer base. And it's hard for all, all, well, all the golf courses that we've really looked at, they've had a history of you know, running out of money because they spend so much money on building it and developing it. And then they bring in new investors or a new group buys it. And then, you know, that usually happens two or three times when a golf course being established. Uh, so I, I've always wanted to stay away from uh, golf courses, but this one was quite special and unique. Uh, the last owner group and this uh, was nine different investors and uh, they've been in it for about 30 years and, and done done a great job with the resort in itself like it's the nicest golf course that i've golfed at like it's just absolutely beautiful uh they were all successful business owners in different regards uh you know some real estate some some not real estate some oil and gas um and and they put a lot of money into this golf resort and uh, they're all retired in that in that age i think the youngest was 72 or 73 and you know the oldest was was well into their 80s so it was just time for them to move on uh they actually approached us because they said you know what this resort needs it needs pinnacle lifestyles and it needs our you know, it needs rvs it needs it needs cabin they wanted to create it they actually had the vision that we're rolling out for kokanee springs and so um yeah you can see some beautiful pictures that, that uh uh, you know, kokiesprings.com or pinnaclelifestyles.ca, but it's a, uh, it's a gorgeous, uh, resort that just needed more people. Um, it's, it's, it's in the Kootenays, which it's crossed from Nelson, uh, on the, on that lake, uh, the Kootenay Lake, a uh, beautiful lake again for, for fishing and boating. Uh, but, uh, six hour drive from Calgary, a little bit more than that from, from Vancouver. And so in order to make the golf course really successful, we need people to come and stay longer and to make the resort successful, we need to be more than a golf resort. And so we are building a, a small private lake on the golf resort uh, so people can swim and paddleboard. And it'll be right in front of our restaurant and bar where we can play music. And, uh, you know, Pinnacle Lifestyle is all about creating community. So we want to bring the people in from their cabins and their RVs and, you know, get them out and, and then do fun activities. And, and we already have a beach just like that. Uh, with the private lake at our Edson property and, and we get, you know, weekends going and or hot summer days. And it's just, it creates that community where mm -hmm. uh, they're making new best friends and, and adults are, are doing the same thing and, and being kids again. 
So, uh, so they ultimately, their vision sold us on like, you're right. This is, this is a golf course I would consider, um, uh, you know, it takes time to build that community. Uh, they have a longstanding customer base that would come golf one or two or three times a year. Uh, but we want to figure out how to get them to stay there longer and how to increase the population in the area. And with 432 mm-hmm. acres, we've got lots of room to, uh, to develop on. So that, that's a bit of the backstory to like how, how we came about that, that one resort. I was talking to a friend of mine this morning about she, uh, she's considering selling her house in Muskoka. And I was saying, you know, with climate change, the way it's, the way it's, you know, the direction it's going is, you know, I, for example, I just saw a bunch of my friends just get back from Florida because they, they do not want to be in Florida for the summer because <laughs> it's, it's already uncomfortably hot there. Yeah. Right. And with climate change, I, I imagine it's going to keep getting warmer, uh, Southern states, even Northern U S states. And I imagine more and more of them will come to Canada, especially with the strength of the dollar just to avoid the heat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. And, uh, and that's another aspect of this space, right? Is that it, it gets people out into nature where they're, you know, if you're, if you're conscious about the environment, we're super conscious about the environment at our resorts and, and you know, use top tier you know, septic systems because we're not usually connected to city sewer, uh, conscious about the amount of water we use. But uh, Kokanee Springs itself is an inland rainforest, kind of the only one of its kind in North America is that that area around uh, Kokanee. And it's, uh, and people are attracted to that because they realize uh, the amount of nature in there is increased. Like it's a crazy amount of wildlife that you see, but it also just feels good to be in that plush rainforest type of a zone. Um, so, so yeah, but I, I totally agree that a lot of people will be coming, coming North and coming to uh, beautiful nature properties, right? Like mm-hmm. the Rocky, mm-hmm. Mountain, Rocky mountains being one of them or like the Muskoka, uh, those are popular places. And, and I think in the long term, those are going to climb up in value more uh, than your typical uh, city destination. Hopefully, you guys hope a uh, host an investor event or something at discounted rates for investors. <laughs> we do, yeah. Investors get discounts. Uh, we have a concierge service that will help them provide their tours uh, to our different destinations. So, uh, yeah, and our big investors kind of get a golf for life at uh, at Kokanee Springs, and uh, but uh, we do we do various investments online. Um, for, for people to see what's provided in the lifestyles fund. Amazing. So yeah, this is, yeah. So that's how you buy a golf. Are you, are you, you can, I imagine you can share how much you pay for the golf course. Yeah, you bet. It's in our offering documents. Uh, so we, we actually had, I think it was 11.4 million somewhere around there was the, uh, the, the actual tax assessment on it, but we only paid 5.4 million for the property and the old owners did roll in 1.4 million so we had to write a check for four million dollars for for this property and like i said we got 62 room hotel as well as the golf course and and some other suites some lots of equipment and golf carts and staff housing and a restaurant and lots of extra acres to develop on so um fantastic buy when you look at a uh, value investment there mm-hmm. uh, my timing might be off but uh... Like golf course, because you 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 bought it late pandemic, am I right? Or um, ooh, yeah, we bought it. It'll our possession date. I think was October. Uh, coming up on two years now. This year will be two years. So yeah, that would be with late or middle pandemic. Right. And so, yeah. but at that point, like golf was on fire. <laughs> I, I, I'm yeah. sorry. You were, were you was there multiple offers like was there any other competition oh there was there was lots of other people looking at it and with different views of what they wanted to do with it um there would have been probably higher bidding on it if it had been like said closer to a main center and that's part of the reason why the price was was more favorable, but the owners also wanted to deal uh, with us because they liked the vision of where we were going to take it. They really care about this property and the whole neighborhood around there. Cause like I said, they spent the last 30 years there. Their friends are there and they're, they've been, a, they, they're the biggest employer. Now we're the biggest employer kind of in that area. Um, so it was important for them to see that area thrive and, and create more employment. And so I believe they could have got a little more uh, selling it to somebody else, but I think they, you know, they made a good decision in, in partnering mm-hmm. with us. Mm-hmm. Which is your favorite property? 
Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Uh, like I said, Kokanee has been the the place that uh, the nicest golf course that I've ever golfed at. Um, it feels like you're in a different world when you're there. Um, you're it's a total slow down, laid back kind of uh, community in a rainforest that you know. So, so I think that is my my favorite place just to be. Um, where my cat cabin is in, in the Sycamus area, it's houseboat capital of Canada. I, I grew up as like water skiing. And so that's my favorite lake is, is, you know, we're on Mara Lake, uh, which is similar to White Lake. They're close to each other. Um, so those are my favorite lakes for sure. So I'm torn between the two, uh, but good, yeah, good question. I, I like to spend time at, at both those destinations. How does someone get to the, uh, the golf course? You mentioned it's far from a major center. Mm-hmm. You can fly into Creston and it's an hour drive from, from Creston, British Columbia. So Creston's fairly close to the U S border. Uh, so it is, is fairly South. Uh, and so that would be your nearest, uh, airport that you can fly into. What else did you look for when you got into this industry, into this, uh, this sector of real estate, you, you mentioned that the, like the, uh, the, the complete imbalance in the, uh, demand for, uh, the number of RVs out there in places they can plug in. What are the what are the things were you looking for, in terms of uh, uh, how to make money in in in, uh, in the sector? Um, real estate in general, location right was big. So um, one of our other themes is just buying in world class destinations. So there's a lot of campgrounds out there. Uh, what which campgrounds are going to do better if campgrounds aren't doing well? You know. I think, I think you gotta be one of the nicer campgrounds. It's gotta be very beautiful and, uh, and it's, and it's gotta be accessible. And so, um, like I said, highway one is where a lot of our properties are because it's super accessible. Uh, but we look into like in the future, where do people want to be and where will value go up? And we think boating as well, RVs, the amount of sales from RVs, the amount of sales from boats have been on a pretty steady incline. And, uh, and so having lakefront access was another big thing that we looked for and, and also having marinas, cause you can imagine the, in today's day and age, how hard it is to go get a marina approved or how to get hard it is to get any development approved on the lake or a gas, you, station. <laughs> gas station <laughs> on the lake. <laughs> yeah. So we're not, we're not looking to buy stuff like that, where we have to go get approvals. Uh, we avoid that, right? That's one of the things just stay away from because. Um, it's a pretty bureaucratic world out there when it comes to getting those kind of approvals and it could take years. You could spend millions of dollars and you could never get there. And so we want stuff that has approvals or in like the golden situation where we're golden property is, um, there is no zoning, uh, on there yet. And there's, so there's no, there's no body overseeing or restricting what we can do. And so we have the ability to develop a new campground just the way we want it. Uh, based on today's market demand, we're looking at doing geodesic domes uh, just to create the buzz and getting people out there uh, right above the river and then and continuing with the, the, the fly fishing that they do off of the river. Um, but we can do that because there's no restrictions. So we would avoid it if there was a, a need to um, you know, get, get a rezone on a property because that, you know, that can be difficult to do. Um, Darvin, I, um, I want to ask, as a lot of beginners and a lot of even veterans, they're always looking for partnerships. They're looking to how to build their teams. Uh, so you came from a finance background. Uh, your company raises money for a living. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who else did you need on your team to make this happen? Uh, on the wealth broker side, like to raise? Uh, no, on this rec on this portfolio oh. of six vacation recreational properties. Yeah. Like that's uh, that, You're not doing this all on your own. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we have... 25 uh, full-time staff that run like the headquarters and, and oversee uh, everything from, we need people in charge of marketing. We need people in charge of sales. Uh, we have a, a planning uh, officer. We have a development officer. Uh, so, you know, we have obviously a fairly large accounting team because we're writing books for, for lots of different companies and destinations. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there's, there's human resource manager. So, so there's quite a, quite a large team that oversees all, you can imagine we have a lot more staff in the summertime when we get busy. Right. So we were well over a hundred, hundred people kind of running the resorts. 
Um, so, so our, our, we started with at the top, you know, getting a board of directors together that had experience in these areas, especially in development and real estate and, uh, and, and that had capital and, and it ran different businesses. Um, so that's the kind of the mature group that's been through multiple recessions and, and they know like how to plan and how to get through all different kind of market environments. And then from the board level, we look at the executive level. And, and again, people that can operate, people that have the piss and vinegar to go out and actually the passion to, to work that, the hours that it takes to work because it's not, it's not a business that runs itself. I haven't found that yet in any of the businesses that we've looked at. Um, this is a, and it's, it's something that we're building. We're not, we're not buying to operate what was there. We're buying to take it to a totally new level. So every property we buy, is, it's got development on it. Uh, and it's got more marketing. We're bringing in a, a, a more customers, and so uh, buying, buying, uh, or building the team has been is critical. And and pe- finding the people with the passion to to run and operate. Lots of times we get lucky because we buy a resort that has people that just love it, and they don't ever want to do anything else. And so we get to keep the, the on site staff that are there, and we've gotten really lucky with that. And in, in, in a couple of our resorts. But we have human resources to go out there and find people that are passionate about that mm-hmm. uh, to, to bring in uh, all the different roles we need for seasonal staff. Now, what about your business partner, Tom? What, what, uh, what's his job in this and what is his experience or background? Uh, he's good. He's a very talented um, young man that uh, did his master's in real estate. So he's, his background, I would say, um, is a combination of, of real estate and investment banker. Uh, so he's worked for big investment banking shops, small investment banking shops. Uh, when you're when you're doing the different kinds of investment that we're doing, uh, you need a, you need a, you need that talent of somebody. He was my head of corporate finance at uh, Pinnacle Wealth Brokers. Uh, so he he spent a couple years looking at all these different private investments and learning what makes them successful, where are the risks, and and what to avoid. And so a uh, very talented uh, uh, man with, with a really bright mind and, uh, and understands the, the number side. So he's, he's really trying to uh, uh, you know, make this work as an investment and he does oversee the development and the operational team. And he's always making sure that the numbers make sense for everybody from an investment standpoint. Now you talking about, you mentioned numbers and where risk, uh, where the risk is like for, um, like before recording, I mentioned like there's there's investors going belly up, over leveraged, uh, likely variable mortgages and rates have gone against them. How mm-hmm. do you how do you guys how do you guys um, rem- uh, mediate? No, how do you manage your risk? Yeah, we mitigate risk uh, with uh, with the debt level. That's that's our biggest thing. Like we we will never go over 60% loan to value, but in general, we're, we're under like we're around a 40% loan to value and we want to keep that lower during times of uncertainty. And so we can, because we have an investment dealer, like one of the biggest risks is like you start spending money on development. And if you don't finish the development, you don't have renters, you don't have your customers coming in yet. And so we see that is a big risk in real estate, uh, and and we avoid that by uh, uh, being able to raise money because we're an investment dealer. So if we need more capital, we can raise more equity. Uh, we don't believe we're going to run out of of the equity needed, but we also are avoiding uh, too much leverage, uh, especially because interest rates are higher. So the lower the interest rate, uh, the more we'd be willing to do, and and we'll slide up the amount of leverage as we're putting in a whole bunch of new RV sites with the intention that we're only going to put in what we think we can sell over the next 12 months. So that means that leverage is going to drop back down again in the short term. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, leveraged over the long term, and, and our model has you know, under 40% leverage uh, for mm-hmm. the long term. And correct me if I'm wrong, when you're raising capital, you're, you're raising uh, equity. You're, it's not debt that you're paying interest on. That's right. We're raising equity only. Yeah. Yeah. We do have, we do have some financing and PDC, C finance fund two. Uh, we have a private l- lender that's finance fund three that we hope to move over to some some uh, like a bank financing next year. And so there there's there's debt that way, but we're not raising capital for the debt side. Uh, you mentioned that you're um, that you mentioned that everything that you touch has approvals for example already. Uh, so that's a that's a risk that uh, novice investors miss out on is that. Uh, 
to, for, to path the least of resistance would be to be on side with whatever government it wants, all levels. How, how yeah. is your how is government for you? Like the Fed, municipal, provincial, are they on board with what you're doing? Oh, I I think they they want it right. They want they want what we want as far as right. like getting people outdoors and and, right. and, uh, and well, you're creating uh, jobs too. <laughs> we're definitely creating jobs, a lot of jobs, uh, and and a lot of environmentally friendly um, development. Um, but I can't say. I mean, they have a process to follow. So when you're dealing at a municipal level, they have to they have to check all the boxes like they do for anybody, whether they they like them or they don't like them. It's it's the same process. And, um, you know, we, we found with our Revelstoke project to be really slow uh, in getting you know, the ability to be able to sell our, our lots. And we did get it. It's just we waited a year and a half to kind of get the answer uh, that we wanted. And that was just just their process that they go through and they get opinions from everybody. And, and uh, ultimately, uh, we got full support. So um yeah we we, we're not stuck on anything on on that level like i said we we're not asking for a lot we're not asking uh uh, for rezoning or we don't need rezoning in sycamus we we are asking for it we don't need it if we get it it's even better for the project uh but uh, we don't buy somewhere where we we need it because that would be that would be too risky for our investment mandate darvin this has been a blast uh i learned a lot hope my listener learned a lot uh, for, for anyone interested in following along or learning more about uh, Pinnacle Wealth or these recreational funds, where, where can they get more information? Yeah, you can go to uh, uh, PinnacleLifestyles.ca, PinnacleWealth.ca for other options that we have at Pinnacle Wealth Brokers. Um, you know, my email is Darvin at PinnacleWealth.ca. Uh, I did we- that, eh? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a D-A-R-V-I-N at pinnaclewealth.ca. Um, this is we, the internet and it's forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to give out a cell phone number of my uh, one of my branch managers, your friend who uh, introduced me to you, Steve Blasiak. He is, uh, uh, he's one of our uh, dealing representatives that if you're looking at investing into a, a fund, uh, he'd be happy to talk to you direct. And uh, I think he gave permission that, hey, if you're interested, give a call. So Steve Blazyak's uh, 416-464-3085. And it's his email, steve.blazyak at pinnaclewealth.ca. And for listening, I'll have this all in the show notes. So don't worry if you're driving or cooking or I don't know what else people do when they listen to the podcast, sleeping. <laughs> okay. Darwin, again, thanks so much for doing this. I understand. I know you're really busy. You got like $1.3 billion to manage and have six recreational properties with hundreds of acres to develop. <laughs> thanks, sir. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show and uh, get in front of all your listeners. So, yeah, appreciate it and hope everyone has a great day. And uh, sorry, I always ask my guests, like, any final thoughts you want to share? Uh, yeah, um, I just I just thought it was a uh, super uh, super interesting. Um, love your podcast, and I am starting to listen to it now. Um, especially you know, your your Mexican fisherman one that you had sent me. Um, yeah, yeah, that got me thinking because yeah, that's that's again like you knew that that was a connection that I'd have. It's like hey, think about how to get to what you want in your life and 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 be able to do what you want to do. And it's not always about money. It's about being able to do what you want to do. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Don't chase the dollar, right? All the time. And, and the, uh, the cool I, thing about uh, like folks our age is because, uh, you know, we're not your level, but many of us who've been around for like 10 years, like they're all now having the Mexican com- uh, fishermen uh, conversation because uh, they have enough now to... For, a, for not a super retirement, but a pretty good retirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, thanks again, Darren, for doing this. I know you got to run. Okay, thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn how to invest in real estate from scratch, my team teaches beginners how to use the number one investment strategy that I personally use in a virtual free training class every month. Go to investortraining.ca slash YouTube to register for our next class. The link is also in the description as well. I publish at least two to three videos a week here, so subscribe if you want to keep learning from seasoned investors like myself and my guests. And if you're just starting out, feel free to ask questions and comment below, and I do the best to answer each of those comments and questions myself. Again, if you're ready to learn the nitty-gritty about real estate investing 
from a professional investor, register for our next virtual class. That's at investortraining.ca slash YouTube. Thanks again for watching. See you in the next video.